Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek and welcome to the second in a series of videos I am doing with the wonderful Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. Gemma, do you want to say hi? Hi everybody. Yes, um, we're heading to the reach today. I'm very excited to do to be discussing this this mysterious and ancient and proud house of Hightower with you, Robert. As, as am I. For those who don't know, this is a six-part series of the two of us are doing. Half of the videos will be over on Gemma's channel and half of them will be on my channel. This is the, the second one. The first one we did was about House Mormont, which is now on the Secrets of the Citadel. So please do go and check that out. I'll put a link down in the description as well. So today what we're doing is we're looking at House Hightower. We're trying to dig into a little bit of the history, but also what's going on with them now and what might it mean for the plot of the story going forwards. And I'm going to put it out there to start with. I think that House Hightower, out of all of the houses we've got, are the most powerful, the most influential family, the most connected family that we hear almost nothing about, certainly on the show, and, and less than we should, I think, in the books. But what's your initial take on House Hightower, Gemma? Yeah, I'm kind of with you. Um, they've had a surprisingly small role in the current series so far um, for a, a house that is, is renowned for being unbelievably wealthy and powerful um and yet it, it's very strange how infrequently they appear um they have this history of patterns of alliances and um compromise and as a result their house has prospered um but th this kind of um not being not doing very much not not getting involved in anything so to speak at least on the surface value we'll dig into that like you said um but it begs the question you know what are they up to are they planning something huge or are they just simply keeping their heads down so to speak yeah i think that for me is the big question there's there's clearly something going on they're clearly a far too clever and influential a house not to be doing anything, but are they making a big play or are they just trying to survive? But let's take this right back to the beginning. So we have House Hightower, who are an ancient house. They're, they're from the dawn of days, we're told. So this is not even like the Age of Heroes. They were initially first men or perhaps even older than that. Now, they are synonymous with the High Tower, which is this tower on an island in what is now old town but when they first arrived there wasn't a tower there there was this kind of fortress of black stone now Gemma do you want to just uh, sort of give us a little bit of a flavor of what this might be uh, that's a huge question. Um, the base of the high tower, it's it's one of the biggest mysteries. Um, I've done an entire series on black stone within um Esos, Westeros. Um I, the, what we seem to get, I mean, there's a lot of talk and uh, about this black stone, which is obviously what the base of the high tower is made out of on Battle Isle, um, which predates the high tower itself. It predates Old Town. It predates ancient families like House Stark, for example. Um, I, I want to just outline that there are actually four, at least four different types of black stone in the known world. Um, and this is where the confusion lies. We've got um, what we refer to as Valerian Dragonstone, which was used um, in Dragonstone on the Valerian Dragon Roads, the inner walls of Tyrosh, the Black Wall of Volantis. And that seems to have been created with dragon fire and or magic, as the legends go. Um, then we've got the this oily or greasy variety of Blackstone, the sea stone chair, the black toad on the Isle of Toads, the ruins of Yin and notably a shy. Um, then we've got um, black basalt, which when it's wet, it has like a, a greasy, oily appearance, which often is why the confusion. This is the ruined curtain wall of Moat Kaelin, the walls of Black Haven in Dawn and Kaya Kaya Naya. Um, they're made from this basalt. And then there's this fused black stone 
which is the base of the high tower and the five forts, which is in the far east. So that connects these two things. And the five forts is a, a huge enigma as well. Um, this is unadorned, um, huge single slabs of near impossible size. And, and their very presence, it, it kind of flies in the face of known history. It's kind of similar to, you know, when we question the pyramids and structures such as Stonehenge, um, and, and we question how could have the people of that age have built something that we would struggle to build today and, it, and it's kind of this surrounding that kind of mystery you know where did it come from why is it called battle isle but then of course the high towers moved in essentially and started building their high tower from this fused and unadorned slab of black stone Thank you. I think that was a fantastic sort of summary of <laughs> what this might be. In terms of sort of the historical context, then, the impression we get, and we don't know all of these things are kind of lost in the mists of time, but the impression we get is that the High Towers came, discovered this uh, black stone. I mean, it's sort of a fortress, but it's not, not a castle so much as, as just like a, a structure that may well have been some sort of trading post for perhaps the antecedents of the Valerians or someone like that, because we hear that there was trading, incidentally, that we could go off on a long uh, digression on this one, but there was trading before the first men came in, there was trading with the the, uh, the children and people like that in Westeros. But the, the high towers, as they became known, moved in, and then over time built on top of it. So they first of all, they built wooden structures. They had four different goes at building a wooden tower. And then they decided, you know what, let's do something permanent. And that's when we get the actual high tower, as we know it, this huge stone structure, which is built on top of that original black uh, structure that we have there at the base. Now, we then have these rumors of who was involved in designing it or building it and the rumor is that this was Bran the Builder or possibly his son also confusingly named Brandon. So we can immediately start doing some sort of age check here between the High Towers and the Starks because Bran uh, the Builder was the founder of House Stark and before that, we've had at least four towers go up and down and some other time before that when the high towers were just living in the black structure. So when we say that house high tower are ancient, we mean ancient. Do you have any thoughts then on this link with Bran the Builder? He seems to have got around quite a lot within <laughs> Westeros. Do, do you think this actually was Bran the Builder who built the high tower? I mean, yeah, like you said, Bran the Builder certainly got around, didn't he? Um, we do know that there are a lot of Brandon Starks. Um, I, I, I could never quite understand why Bran would want to build the High Tower. What we know, what Bran the Builder, what, what in what interests, um, he, you know, that the structures that he's been attributed with having an involvement with all seem to have. Um, these magical properties, or, or people seem to think that they have magical properties, the wall, Storm's End, uh, Winterfell, or uh, specifically the crypts. Um, we know that the um, it was an Uthor high tower. Uthor, King Uthor of the high tower um, was the one who replaced the wooden into stone. And again, like you said, with the help of Bran the Builder, um, this, this, there's, there's so many references within House Hightower. Um, we've got Arthurian legend there. We've got Lord of the Rings in there. We've got the pharaohs of ancient Egypt in there, throughout scattered throughout the references of their history. But yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't obviously the the question of was it Bran the Builder or not is is a very difficult one to answer. But it does give us a kind of indication of dating. Um, we're looking around when the wall was built and House Hightower is one of the few houses that has this huge history prior to this 8,000 year mark, which is where most things, the wall was erected and, and House Stark was established. And, and that's where the story seems to kind of start. But House Hightower goes way beyond this, which is 
insane. Um, this takes them into the 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 you know the um, the the ancient kings, the the empire of the amethyst um, emperor, and all of the um, the the gemstone kings and queens. You know, we're taking it right back even there, which could attribute to some of the look of the, the two high tower characters that we actually have descriptions for yeah i think that the the high tower itself so there's two things here first is the age of house high tower which i think adds a certain degree of mystery if nothing else i don't think this means that just because they're an ancient family they therefore have to have some kind of ancient secret but it does mean that there's a lot of wisdom which is passed down through the ages from generation to generation and then the second thing is the high tower itself which as you say has this kind of aura of magic to it certainly the fact that it has stayed there for apparently thousands of years perhaps eight thousand years seemingly in the same condition that it always was does seem to imply that there is something magical about it even if it's just in its longevity you alluded to a few kind of real world um or other uh, literary kind of things that get that this might be a reflection of i i always think of the lighthouse of alexandria which was one of the original seven wonders of the world which was said to be massively tall i think it was like a hundred meters high and uh, was renowned across the world um you talked and we before going on there you you mentioned as well the link across to the lord of the rings do you just want to quickly sort of tease out the idea of this high tower this tall tower where the inspiration might be coming from yeah i, I agree with you with the um the lighthouse of alexandria i mean the the high tower is it serves as it's like a giant candle essentially and we'll talk about candles i'm sure um but it, it also serves as um like a sundial of sorts and and when you said about um the, the wonders of the world um and the Song of Ice and Fire has its own version of the nine wonders made by man, written by Lomas Longstrider, of which the High Tower is one of these. Um, but the, I mean, when you actually look at the High Tower, specifically perhaps more the sigil of the High Tower, which is a very crude drawing of a tower with the flame at the top, um, all that sigil needs, as far as Lord of the Rings goes, is an Eye of Sauron at the top of that. <laughs> um and and it, and it does have this kind of all seeing eye kind of vibe i mean i'm not going to start getting into illuminati conspiracies or anything like that but one of the versions of the all seeing eye you know the eye in the pyramid that we see and uh, one of the versions of that is actually um an eye in a flame uh, rather than a pyramid um but as far as the lord of the rings part goes um I mean, and really, this kind of relates to uh, Leighton Hightower, the current late Lord of um, House Hightower, who we will definitely delve into more. Um, but Denethor in Lord of the Rings, the steward of Gondor, had um, a palantar, which is like a crystal ball in which he could view events and communicate across vast distances. And again, Leighton, glass candles, lots to discuss there. Um, but Denethor says, do you think the eyes of the White Tower are blind? I have seen more than you know. With your left hand, you would use me as a shield against Mordor, and with your right, you'd seek to supplant me. I know who rides with Theoden of Rohan. Oh, yes, word has reached my ears of this Aragorn, son of Arathon, and I tell you now I will not bow to this ranger from the north, last of a ragged house long bereft of lordship. Um, and, and it's it's obviously there's parallels to be drawn here, um, and that does, in my mind, specifically relate to Leighton High Tower. But I mean, there's all sorts. I like to look at these symbols and just think what it conjures up in my mind. Like you said, you thought of Alexandria. For me, um, I read tarot cards, and it reminded me of the tower, the tower tarot card. I mean, if you look at the tarot tarot the tarot tower card tower tower tarot. tarot. Yeah. Yeah, yep, that one. <laughs> that's, that's a mark that easy for me to say. Um, 
but that's it, it's almost the the sigil it's it's like the same thing this burning tower um the the tower in tarot means danger and crisis and destruction but also liberation and it's associated with sudden unforeseen change i mean i i don't know if there's any wider implications to that i just like to look at symbolism and things and think you know we know george r, r. martin collects inspiration from oh, for, from everything from greek mytholo mythology and legends and history real world history to album metal covers and lyrics from songs and pop culture it it, it takes them from everywhere um but yeah i, I really enjoy the, the the like you said the magic that surrounds the high tower i mean it's supposed to be higher than the wall um, and apparently on, on a clear day, because it does get very foggy in Old Town, but on a clear day when it's not so foggy, apparently you can see the wall from the top of the high tower. Now, I'm not sold on that, but I do have a... No, Planetos is flat, confirmed. Yes. <laughs> yes, we have. A, yeah, so we've now got the Illuminati and the flat earth in this. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I, I kind of have... Um, an idea what what this being able to see the world thing is coming from and it does relate more to magic than literally being able to see the world but we'll we'll get into all of that yeah i think that's a, a deliberate link across between these two ancient structures and also the brand the builder link i think it's the kind of story which it might be true but similarly it's just that oh we know a an ancient hero who built big things why not say he built this one as well that's the kind of thing i don't think it adds too much to the story either way uh, if he did build it or if he didn't for me in terms of the kind of the imagery that's going on here whatever he inspiration he drew from different places it's very clear that the image of a wizard on top of his tower is very very strong here yes. uh, we always hearing Leighton Hightower is the current Lord Hightower and he is up there we'll get to him in a bit but he's up there at the top of his tower and apparently hasn't come down for 10 years and has been, is doing all kinds of magical research and the image of the magician at the top of his tower is a strong one throughout fantasy literature and that's what George R. R. Martin I think is wanting us to think here there's another one as well there's the tower of babel in genesis um which is meant to explain why people of the world speak different languages i am summarizing that very quickly but again this is this this myth of the, the and the term ivory tower um which suggests that somebody is disconnected from the reality of everyday life and average people because they've spent too much time um on intellectual pursuits in their metaphorical ivory tower um again very much speaking of you know that the speculation that surrounds leighton hightower yes i mean i don't think there's any hint of challenging the gods which is what is within the, the tower of babel uh yes. idea but yes i think i think both of those things are very relevant to the the one thing that i would add to this it's, it's perhaps in contrast to your i thought it was very interesting what you're saying about the the tower tarot card with change is that i've always viewed it as being quite a sign of stability and continuity when we read about old town and we'll come on to old town in just one second when we read about old town with the high tower is in the center of it people tell the time by where the shadow of the high tower is and when it's foggy the ships can come in up the river because they see the flame atop the high tower and yeah. this is we very much exactly we light the way so this is very much that they are there they are always there they will always be there the tower is there it will always be there and it's a marking of time passing by but they remain so I think that that's, for me, that's one of the strong images that we've got going on here. But I wanted to bring on to Old Town, because this is the, the second bit when we're thinking about the high towers, is that they don't just live in a high tower. The high tower is in the centre of this massive city. And we often don't think about it so much, particularly because in the show and in the books, it's not shown as much as King's Landing, but... For almost the entirety of the history of Westeros, Old Town was 
the biggest city, the most important city. This was the centre of everything. What do you think the importance of Old Town is as a place to understand and reflect the importance of the High Towns? Well, it, it's kind of, I mean, the fact it's called Old Town, you know, suggests that it is very old. I mean, it's the centre of the citadel. It's the centre of the starry sept. Um, the Order of the Maesters and the Faith of the Seven both essentially came from Old Town. They certainly have their hubs there. Um, and both the Citadel and the Faith have heavy and very strong connections with House Hightower. This seems to be this triumvirate of, of these three great powers, which on the surface kind of seem at odds with each other. Um, but Old Town itself was built around the Hightower. It kind of sprang up and it's obviously her naval it has it's it's a port essentially um and and george r martin places a heavy emph emphasis on trade and how the um a town will prosper um it, it has um the honey wine and it has the potential it's been attacked by ironborn a lot as as you know this is this double-sided coin but essentially it's prospered through trade and its ability to trade and therefore a massive lighthouse makes sense in a very pragmatic terms in a in a port in a trading port um but yeah i think a lot of the wealth and the riches that house hightower and indeed the the faith and the citadel seem to be reaping definitely come from this um i think george r martin himself actually lived um on a harbor when he was growing up so he was very well versed in in trading routes and how that worked and and what was brought on and brought on to ships and you know i think he watched a lot of that as a young child and took a lot of inspiration from that but i really enjoy the fact that we we get these mundane's not really quite the word but this more kind of realistic sense of, of a workable continent and that there will be particular zones that make use of the geography of the land and the rivers that are coming into it and this is where the the towns and the the cities spring up isn't it it is and this is very true to life on earth as well yeah. if you look at the history of earth where civilization sprung up was on the coast or along rivers. When you think about Egypt, it's all about the Nile. When you get the Tigris and the Euphrate, uh, Euphrates is where, where civilization started really springing up and taking hold. If you look at the ancient cities of Europe, you look at uh, Rome or Paris or London on rivers. This was the lifeblood of the ancient world. And if you look at Westeros, that's the same case again. There are a couple of exceptions, uh, Winterfell, exception to everything, obviously, and uh, the Erie, uh, because it's like on the top of a crazy high mountain. Uh, but generally speaking, if it's a big and important city, King's Landing, Old Town, Lannisport, Gull Town, Planky Town, Sunspear, they're on the coast or on a river. Yeah. And that is where wealth comes from, because it comes from trade. And the Honeywine River goes into the Reach, which is the lushest, most fertile, and therefore uh, richest area for people to be living in. So to, to have your city at the mouth of the Honeywine gives you the perfect trading opportunities that you could possibly have. So they have become rich. Old Town is huge, and House Hightower has become rich this. George R. Martin says that they are as rich as the Lannisters, which is not the kind of impression you'd have got from watching the show, for example. The Lannisters seem to be in a completely different sphere to everyone else, but House Hightower have got as much money as them. And this translates across in terms of the size of the army and navy that they put forward as well. The Reach has got the largest army in the Seven Kingdoms, and the largest army within the Reach is House Hightower's army from Old Town. So what, they are hugely really, rich. What's really fascinating about the, the strength and sheer size of Hightower's navy and their army is their lack of involvement in the recent wars means that their forces yeah. are essentially untouched at this stage, which is not something that the other houses can claim. 
No, I agree completely. And this is, this is, I think, starting to give us a hint to what House Hightower's game is, is that they are deliberately staying out of this until they know who's going to win. Um, <laughs> and that's the point at which they'll start getting involved. They'll put out their tentacles, they'll sit there, but they are so strong that they know that they can survive. But there is um, precedent for us to assume this, isn't there? They've, they've got previous... As oh, far as this goes. many many times and this is this is something that we see time and again so going back through history just to take for example the the targaryen invasion just randomly what happened was uh, the the targaryens invaded and their liege lords uh the house gardener said right let's go and defend ourselves against them and they kind of hummed and hawed and basically eventually said no and obviously what then happened was the field of fire and their overlords got wiped out then they opened the gates and allowed the targaryens in and they survived so they were just waiting looking seeing what was happening they'd obviously spotted what was going on with things like harren hall and all the rest of it and they waited until the final moment and then decided that's the side who's going to win we'll go with them and the the high septon um during that time obviously crowned um aegon the conqueror so they you know after all was said and done they certainly welcomed house targaryen into westeros um very overtly um anointing and and then um not long after that it's cerise hightower who married um magor was obviously a hightower but she was also the niece of the high septon so again they're all embroiled aren't they so you know when we look at what the the faith of the seven did and how they welcomed the Targaryens, we can attribute that directly to the views of House Hightower. And then Hightower itself has a history of being allied with House Targaryen when it suits. Yes. And maybe we'll get onto some of these instances in time. I just want to very quickly pick up on one other point, which uh, just when I was researching for this beforehand, which I hadn't really noticed before. But House Hightower has a bank. Now, this sounds quite normal in a way, but when you think about it in terms of where are the riches of the world, we think of the Iron Bank of Bravos. And what happened about 150 or more years before the, the, the series is that there was this huge bank in lease that went bankrupt effectively. And the high towers went, oh, so uh, there's now a gap in the market. Clearly having a bank is a way to make lots of money. Let's set one up here. And that is, for me, another example of them going, OK, here's another realm that we can push our way into to get some kind of control, control over the money in Westeros and, and wider. And that is put down as one of the key reasons for them keeping their level of wealth up. When the Lannisters are literally sitting on a gold mine, the high towers are just as wealthy as they are because they control a bank. This is more recent information, isn't it, from Fire and Blood? Yes. Um, this um, that they after that they basically took advantage of um, the Rogaire Bank of Lease when it ran dry, and and again, this is what this is for me a clue that House Hightower do have um, an important role to play because George R. R. Martin went out of his way to include further details, compounding the wealth of House Hightower in his most recent publication. Um, everything's in these texts for a reason. Um, we've looked through Fire and Blood and seen many hints towards what Euron might be up to in these sample chapters that we've seen. And and again, they're put there for a reason. We've, we've had more information about House Mormont, which we discussed last week. So, you know, if, if House Hightower didn't have an important role and that wasn't linked to their vast wealth that's been accumulated why mention it again in fire and blood which george r martin has done so again i think this is further clues that house hightower most definitely has a role to play in the future and uh, just the concept that uh, a house that is not one of the primary noble houses um uh, because house hightower is not um mm. Is is wealthy as if not wealthier than House Lannister is 
I don't think we can, like you said, they 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 handled this slightly differently in the show, but in in the books, House Lannister is far from bankrupt. Far from. <laughs> well, yes, and and one other thing, just in terms of that power compared to the Lannisters, which I picked up from Fire and Blood, was there was a throwaway comment when, uh, and I forget which which of the Lannisters it was, when they were trying to get hold of some dragon eggs. And the line was that the hope was that the Lannisters would therefore get dragons and perhaps be able to leapfrog those three most powerful um, families in the land, yeah. being houses Baratheon, Velaryon and Hightower. And I suspect if you were to ask show-only people who were the three most powerful families in the land, they would certainly have not mentioned Hightower and Velaryon. No. Um, uh, but that's how they were viewed as being one of the preeminent houses in the entire land. And of course, if you look at recent history, um, there was um, an, a marriage proposal proposed, um, an alliance between houses Lannister and Hightower. Um, Tyrion was put forward as a match for one of Leighton Hightower's many, many daughters. He's got 10 true-born children, Taria Florent, who all lived to adulthood, which is insane in itself. Um, and Leighton Hightower just slammed that idea. And yet later um, was apparently quite indifferent or happy or or, or whatever uh, um, at the fact that his daughter Liness wanted to marry Jorah Mormont. Now if we were to look at these you know House Mormont and House Lannister surely you would want to ally yourself with a rich house like House Lannister even if this was a dwarf that was being presented as a potential husband. Do you think there's a possibility that House Hightower simply doesn't need the connections between themselves and House Lannister, or want them? I think that's probably true. I think there are a couple of layers here. The, the first one is that this was seen as an insult, I'm pretty sure, uh, to suggest, hey, why don't you why don't you marry Tyrion, who was seen as, as, as a deformed and a dwarf and an insult to his, his family's name. And so that was seen as like an insult the other one is that we talk about House Hightower's being hugely connected, which they are. They've married into most of the major families during their time. Yeah. Uh, and you're a Game of Thrones family tree person, so I'm happy for you to, to, <laughs> to tell me exactly all the different families they are married in in just one moment. But to, to the best of my knowledge, their links to the North are very limited. And so the idea that they might start bridging that gap now that, that the North was clearly very much not just a part of the Seven Kingdoms, but given the link between Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon, finally an actual player in the politics of the Seven Kingdoms, that I think is, is part of the reason why they might have allowed it. And let's not overlook the fact that perhaps they just felt, you know what, she wants to marry him, why not? True love is perfect and beautiful. <laughs> it's not entirely how it panned out, but yeah. No, okay, it's not, we'll obviously. No, but but <laughs> but I can certainly imagine the case of her saying, I want to marry this person and then being allowed to simply because, you know, why not? I've just pulled up my family tree for you. Um, there are 10 high towers in my family tree um, that are connected the, through marriage um i'm not going beyond the others um and this is i started my family tree with aegon the conqueror and kind of spread out from there um we've got lady allery hightower who is marjorie's mother so her connections are to obviously house tyrell um, and then Marjorie, of course, she has connections with House Baratheon. Um, so there's a lot going on there. Leighton him himself was married to a Florent, um, the sister. I think this makes Sam and um, Shireen cousins because through marriage, because um, I think, and, and the, so it's Sam's mother is the sister of oh I, I think it's 
it, then there's there's connections all over the place. It gets very very <laughs> complicated. And then of course you've got connections with House Mormont, Layla Hightower married Sir John Cups, um, Gunther Hightower married a Fossaway, the Green Apples. Um, Denise Hightower married uh, a red wine. They, these are prominent families. Um, and then, of course, we have multiple Targaryen and Hightower connections, possibly most famously um, with the Dance of the Dragons. Uh, but it wasn't just um, Alicent Hightower. It was um, Otto Hightower was also a hand of the king as well. So it's not just through marriage that these alliances are made. Um, there are white cloaks, Gerald Hightower, the white bull um, in the King's Guard, and there are multiple hands of the king. The Hightowers are everywhere, absolutely yeah. everywhere. And I'm just mentally going through those those families. There doesn't appear to be there for a big link to the north as i suspected there's a very strong link in the reach yes other big families in the reach other rich families in the reach and there's a very strong link across to the targaryens and through that obviously the baratheons and the valarions yes so they are very connected but perhaps this was the start of an attempt to become more connected outside that kind of uh, rich southern Westeros kind of uh, band that they've got going on there. I think uh, very much with Marjorie, um, you know, the connections with the Tyrells and High Towers, obviously they're very much within the reach, but then Marjorie seemed to be their play um, towards House Baratheon and the Crown, which is what they had done historically when the Targaryens were on the throne. They seemed to make a play towards the ruling, the, the monarchs, basically. They they did the Targaryen thing. Obviously, the Baratheons, um, as soon as they were able to move in to the Baratheons, um, obviously, Joffrey and Tommen being the, the, the next generation, um, there was no president for marrying. The Lannisters got in there with uh, Robert Baratheon, but they moved in the second they could there. Um, and of course, Marjorie is a Tyrell, so we don't necessarily immediately associate her with House Hightower, but she is most definitely a Hightower on her mother's side. Her mother is the daughter of the Lord of Hightower. Yeah, so what we've got is the Hightowers, and we'll say, say this, I suspect, again and again. They are making sure they are tied in to the most important, powerful people. They are trying to make sure that they survive and are linked in to people who can ensure their survival. Yeah, can I, I think the safe bet was Renly at first, wasn't it? I mean, at the beginning, it, it was. It, it looked like Renly had it in the bag, you know, until Melisandre and Stannis made a shadow baby demon assassin. And that all went horribly wrong. But yeah, sorry, go on. No, no, no. I, th I, no, I think that's an important point because they, so having made their play, they then sat back a bit to see what happened and see how it panned out. But they never, and this was uh, something that if you've seen my videos on uh, Robert's Rebellion, that I felt that House Tyrell did, they hung back enough that they could be pretty sure that no, that whoever was in charge couldn't actually accuse them of being disloyal yeah. in the extreme. They've just stayed back and done what is needed in order to protect themselves. And yet, in a clash of kings, despite the fact that Marjorie is married to Renly, the High Towers refuse to support Stannis after Renly's assassination. Um, the high tower, like you said, they 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 stay out of it as long as they possibly can. Um, most of the reach moved straight over to Stannis after Renly was assassinated. Um, Marjorie obviously moved on to <laughs> to the other side of the Baratheons, um, but the high towers again, they just they, they hold back. It's almost like they have one foot in each pond, isn't it? Just just a toe dipped in each one. Yes, and it's worth noting that. 
even though they were supportive of the Tyrells, there were also some of their bannermen who were supportive on the other side. So exactly. all the t- all the time there, there's just like this options here, options there. But then they try and figure out who's going to win. They stuck with Renly, I suspect, because they knew or they they after Renly's death, they stuck effectively with that side because they realised that this was going to be the Lannisters rather than Stannis who was going to win. Yeah. Um, and that was what they did rather than just going mo- naturally moving across to where uh, others might expect them to go. They went to where the power was. But let's move on to the Faith of the Seven because we've talked a bit about the High Tower and their sort of their history uh, of open base as it were we've talked a little bit about old town and the size and scale and, and wealth of their home city but within old town there are both the maesters and the home effectively the home base or the starting point for this faith of seven within the seven kingdoms what do you think or how strong do you think is this link between House Hightower and the Faith of the Seven, and why do you think it's there? Um, the why is another question altogether. Um, I think there is a huge connection. Um, we know that the High Towers were one of the first great noble families to even accept the Faith of the Seven as their uh, religion. Um, they continue to give their patronage to the office of the High Septon. We know um, at least during the time of Aegon's conquest that one of the High Septons was a High Tower. Um, and, and, and there's no reason to think that that hasn't, that pattern hasn't continued, that there are, have been many more High Towers within the Starry Sept. Um, I, I mean, there, there is, if you look at, in real world terms, you know, we, we look at um, the Pope and the Vatican, that's kind of our faith of the seven vibe, isn't it? And, and there's power behind that. You know, it, it's it's obviously a religion, um, but they have a lot of power within, it's the dominant religion in Westeros for a start. Um and it's it's power in numbers almost. You know that there are things that the the High Septon can say and decrees um, that people will absolutely buy into, believe in 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 completely. Um, this is the High Septon himself during Aegon's conquest. It, it was him, and this is the High Tower. He was a High Tower. He said that if they didn't open the gates um to the targaryens um i I can't remember how there's a prophecy um let me i've got it here somewhere prophecy here we go um if old town and the high towers turn against the dragons old town will fall and this started with aegon's conquest now i'm not sure how much stock they truly take in this like you said they they definitely seem to be playing both sides throughout history and um, even during the dance of the dragons which we can touch upon in a what in a moment um but yeah they, they kind of they're kind of one that they, they're they're not it's not as though that there's these two separate entities that rose up independently and then support each other i i think they rose up um in tandem um alongside the citadel which again has its roots in um prince perimor the twisted another high tower yes i, I want to move on to the maesters in just one moment i just want to tease out a little bit more about the faith so my take is that the high towers with a couple of exceptions they don't seem to be these kind of uh, rabid true believers in the faith of the seven. They're, they're not out there uh, um, proselytizing all over the place saying you have to believe this or, or you're going to die. Yeah. But they see the value and worth of the faith. Now, Aegon, for me, when Aegon came across and they let him in, this for me is the, the height of them showing how much they realize the power of the faith of the seven and how they can use that to further their own power. Aegon came in, and this was a big deal. Old Town, as we said at the time, King's Landing didn't really exist. 
Old Town was the biggest city in the entire continent. And what they did was they made sure that Aegon was crowned by the High Septon. And what that in one instance did was not just say, you, Aegon, are the rightful king of this Seven Kingdoms, but they also said the people who have the power to decide that are the faith of the Seven. Yes. That was a huge deal because previously there was, you know, particularly up in the north and, and various other places, there was not this acceptance that the person who should uh, morally decide who the king is and should crown who the king is was the faith of the seven. But H House Hightower saw this opportunity and said, no, this is how it's going to happen. So from that moment on, it they married the faith with the the rulers. And that meant that the rulers, even when uh, the the centre of the faith in a way moved across to King's Landing because the starry sept and the heart of the faith of the seven was still in the citadel. That meant that the high towers always had some degree of power. So it was a two way thing that they were trying to do there. In my view, they were trying not just to get on side with the Targaryens, but also to legitimize the faith of the seven as the authorizing uh, body within the seven kingdoms. And that, actually is probably we see it played out in fire and blood but also a long way through the, the whole reign of the targaryens that is where the high towers get the most tension is when the targaryens who really were only doing this for show they didn't really want to be following the faith of the seven they just wanted to have the crown put on their head by somebody who everyone would recognize when they came into conflict with the faith of the seven that that was when House Hightower seemed to have the biggest problems when they were there, unsure on which side to go on. There are dragons coming to at us, but we've got uh, all of these um, uh, zealots outside the city um, being uh, whipped up by some leader. Uh, what do we do? Who's, whose side are we on? Are we on the side of the faith or are we on the side of the king? So that is when they've had a problem. And when they've been strong is when they've managed to marry both of those two sides. Yeah, this is this continued pattern of um, allegiances and compromises that this um, that House Hightower has made. They don't win through war and conquest. They win through compromise and uh, allegiances, essentially. And yes, you're you're completely right. They're, they're, the House Hightower are not running around trying to convert people to the faith of the Seven. They are not um, like the followers. Relor, for example, who are openly preaching the word of their God, um, it seems to be very much more um, an allegiance of in mutual interests almost. Um, because, I mean, there are rumors that surround um, Leighton Hightower and his daughter of necromancy and magic, which appears to be completely at odds with the ideology of the Starry Sept and both the Citadel as well. Um, Kyburn, case in point, necromancy is not tolerated within these um, factions. And we, we don't know for a fact if House Hightower are involved in this but that's certainly the rumors i mean it's a good story to be fair isn't it this this strange lunatic man in this tower for 10 years who can see the wall and practices all these crazy magics with his his daughter and you know we could we could put a lot onto that or we can say it's it's a great story for the small folks to to pass along each other you know when actually we don't have any information or details but yeah as far as the collaboration between these factions go it, it's it's based on mutual interests and power um i think the high towers are very clever um when you win through conquest and wars you you lose you lose men you lose manpower you lose resources high tower have managed so far to win continuously without losing anything really yes and i think crucially they're also willing not to be the most important people they don't necessarily want to be up there as one of the paramount houses they probably would have had the chance when house gardener fell to say you know what 
we're the richest house in this whole continent, make us in charge of the reach. But they didn't go for that. They went for the option of actually, you know what, we've got uh, the maesters and we've got the the faith of the seven and we will set up a way in which we can have influence across the whole continent which doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that we're actually the people that people that everyone looks to they have got more soldiers than house tyrell they have got more uh, they've got a bigger navy than house tyrell they've got more money than house tyrell they've got more influence than house tyrell they do not need to be house tyrell they're already better than them yeah, allow House Tyrell to be the object, the, the target, while they quietly behind the scenes. Um, I think the only overt play that we've ever seen from House Hightower throughout history um, at a power grab was the Dance of the Dragons. And even then, they kind of did it through the guise of House Targaryen. Um, the, the, the Greens were very much Alicent Hightower and Otto Hightower. Uh, maneuvering to put um, Alicent's son on the Iron Throne. But again, even during that, um, although the Hightowers seem to be openly strong supporters of the Greens, um, their banner houses, uh, the Costains, the Mullendors and the Beesburys, they fought for the Blacks. So again, they had this one foot on each side, didn't they? So even their most overt play was hidden in layers of Targaryens and having their their bannermen in strategic positions on the other side. So yeah, again, so you know, when all is said and done, they essentially lost the Dance of the Dragons, but they came out smelling of roses because it was all House Targaryens' fault, wasn't it? It, it was, and again what they didn't do was to overstep the mark and say this is house hightower taking control exactly. yeah no uh, it's all house this is targaryen this is a civil war between two targaryens we just happened to be involved but it was it was alison and otto that instigated um you know when the series died and they they kept his corpse for days they didn't announce it they were maneuvering behind the scenes uh, it was all the high towers, but you know, maybe like a renegade faction that kind of overstepped a little bit. But again, still covering them their backsides every step of the way. Yeah, and I agree with that completely. And I think that that's uh, in marked contrast to what we see on the show with Cersei taking control, where she just becomes a new dynasty. Yes. Cersei of, of House Lannister, first of her name. That is a Lannister takeover as opposed and, and, to the slightly more subtle, it's still Targaryens, but secretly behind the scenes it's High Towers doing things. And um, like you said with House Tyrell, it just paints a huge target on these houses, doesn't it? House Tyrell, House Lannister. The High Towers, it's 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 masterful, really, what's going on behind the scenes. It it, it is. And I mean I'm gaining renewed respect for them the more we talk about them, I have to say. And one other of the organizations that has power over the entirety of Westeros and we get lots of descriptions of this power they're the people in charge of the messages they're the people in charge of healing they're the people in charge of teaching all of the noble children who grow up they're the people in charge of advising the lords and ladies of the land they're the people who hold all of the knowledge in the land uh, it's the maesters and the maesters are effectively tenants. They do own their own land, but it was gifted to them within Old Town by House Hightower. How do you see that kind of link playing out, or how would you describe the link between those two groups? Well, it, it was more than that, wasn't it? Again, it was um, a Hightower that um, founded the Citadel um, from very um, humble beginnings. I mean, it wasn't as though there, there weren't learned men um, beforehand because there was, um, but it was Uthor's son, one of his sons, Prince Perimor the Twisted, who has a lot of parallels to King Tutankhamun actually with the scoliosis. Um, but he basically founded the Citadel um, because he wanted 
this this group of learned men that went out and seeked higher mysteries and and information and house high tower to this day continues to be patrons of the citadel in the same way they are the faith of the seven so it's more than a gift they continue to support financially the citadel and that is a huge investment and again it's the same they have um so much clout so much influence the citadel um we know that um the the maesters drop their last names so who's to say there aren't many high towers lurking around um as maesters um we, we know that their maester wally maester wallace um is a son of a high tower girl and the arch maester of the citadel so you know high towers are uh having illicit affairs with the archmaesters um yeah. so you know this is more than just it it's it's all embroiled these connections again it's these alliances that are made that they seal the deal with marriages and children and bloodlines essentially they seal the deal with financial support and it's again this mutual benefit i mean the every noble house in westeros has a maester and essentially that means that all the information that is gleaned from from north to south of westeros goes back to the citadel and who pays the citadel house high tower yeah and with all good conspiracy theories it's follow the money isn't it Absolutely. and so, so if we're saying that the maesters have access to all of the information and everything that's going on because they do because they run raven mail yep. and they've got access to all of the ancient information from the past the histories and all the rest of it who bankrolls them exactly well, it's, it's partly through the, the the money that the noble families give to pay for the having maesters there but it's also from house hightower the most important voice in the citadel is house hightower because they're the ones who are providing the funding yeah so we've got now this picture that we're starting to build up of this family who are ancient who are there in control of the largest most powerful richest city in uh, the well not quite the largest king's landing is now the largest but uh, certainly the most historical and richest city in the several kingdoms We've got the family who are as rich as the Lannisters, who have got the largest part of the largest army in the entirety of Westeros, who've got huge links across to the faith of the seven, therefore moral leadership across the entirety on religious leadership across the entirety of the seven kingdoms sort of south of the neck largely. And also they are bankrolling the maesters who are everybody's favorite conspiracy theory. So <laughs> we've got a hugely powerful house here. And there's one other element that we've kind of touched on a few other times are these rumors of magic. Now, do you want to just riff on this idea of the, the high towers are not just hugely politically powerful in their own right, but they've also got magical understanding of what's going on? Yeah, this is very much a rumour uh, that surrounds Leighton Hightower and his daughter, Melora, known as the Mad Maid. Um, Leighton Hightower is an enigma. He's probably one of the most intriguing characters that we've heard pretty much nothing about and again I, I, I and I have to really um, express we don't know anything about Leighton so this is very much rumor and this could be nothing more than this lovely small folk myths that they like to talk and create but there could be something more into this like we've, we've explored that the high towers potentially have unlimited access to the citadel not just the information that they're gleaning from across across westeros but also you know those choice texts that may be lurking in some vaults somewhere um according to the rumors leighton is reportedly consulting books of spells with his daughter melora he's been locked in this high tower for a decade 10 years nobody has seen him or heard from him um there's some connections with 
and, and I think this is where these glass candles come in. And this is why I was talking about Denethor from Lord of the Rings earlier on with his palantar that he could see using his crystal ball, essentially, um, which is very much similar to the concept of the glass candles in the Song of Ice and Fire. Um, it's claimed that when these glass candles burn, which we know the Citadel has these for sure, um, that sorcerers can see across mountains and seas and deserts and give men visions and dreams and communicate with one another half a world apart. Now, this reminds me of this claim that we discussed in the very early stages um, that you can see the wall from the high tower and we both immediately said oh that's doubtful that's it's about 2000 miles something like that it's it's a very long long way away and even on a beautiful clear day i'm not sure how you know with the naked eye that you no matter how tall the high tower is if you could genuinely see the wall but perhaps this is more a metaphorical seeing of the wall through a glass candle if Leighton Hightower is in possession of a high, uh, glass candle again, all speculation because we just don't know. But if he is, and we know he potentially has access to glass candles through the Citadel, then he could very well be sat in his high tower, looking at the wall and beyond through the glass candles, which are now burning. They are. And we have a few different quotes of people saying that the glass candles are burning. Quaith says it, the yeah. glass candles are burning in a kind of ominous way. Uh, someone else, uh, Zaro Zon Daxos, uh, says, it is said that the glass candles are burning in the house of Urathon Nightwalker. They have not burned in a hundred years. And this idea, and we see also in pretty much the last chapter we've got of A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, Canon A Song of Ice and Fire, we've got uh, Sam coming up there to Marwyn's chambers and there's a glass candle burning there and apparently he's been watching Sam's progress through this. This means that people can see stuff from afar. So suddenly the world that we knew where people didn't didn't know what was happening in different places where there was mysteries going on because people just didn't understand what somebody was doing. That world is coming to an end because people can now start understanding what's happening. And it's, it's like the Westerosi version of Skype, isn't it? Essentially. <laughs> well, yes, but it's more powerful than Skype because it's, yes. it's imagine Skype, but you can flick it on and the other person doesn't know that you've got it on because if you've got, um, Marwin, who's been tracking Sam's progress, then Sam's not sat there also with a glass candle burning and having a two-way conversation. And they're um, quite open about it, aren't they? When Sam says, how did you know, um, Alaris sort of nods to the glass candle and says, we've been watching you. Yeah, yeah, it's very sinister. Um, uh, and it's it's creepy in the way that Bran's very creepy when he's sort of like telling people about what they've been doing. And it's like, oh, really? Um, you looked beautiful that night, Sansa. And it's like, no, no, I don't want to know that you were watching. And it's the same kind of idea here that you can, through a glass candle, you can see things that are happening. Now, what that means is that the few people in Westeros, and we don't know many people in Westeros who have got them, they seem to be centered around Old Town, as you say, that there are the, the four that we know about there in the Citadel. We've got Marwyn's definitely got access to one. The High Towers almost certainly have access to one. They are going to start knowing what's going on in the world, if only they know where to look. And so for the last few years, if we've got Leighton High Tower there with a glass candle, he almost certainly will have started to pick together the pieces of what's going on so that he can then carry on, this is my suggestion, he can carry on with this millennia old tradition of House Hightower surviving. What yeah. do they have to do to survive? So I'm going to bring this around now to probably where, where we're going to sort of round this off, but with this idea of so what? So we have this hugely powerful family who've survived for a long time who've got links across all of the power bases that there are in the seven kingdoms who might know huge amounts of stuff they might be hugely powerful they're also cautious they also play both sides a lot but they've they've taken a back seat in the story so far what's 
what does this imply? Surely they're not going to stay quiet all the time. What might happen next, do you think? Um, I think Joran Greyjoy's, um, where he's going in the winds of winter, is going to bring the high towers to the forefront. Um, I think they will be forced into action in so much as protecting Old Town and protecting therefore themselves. Um, and you mentioned Sam um, in the, obviously he's now in the Citadel in the show. He, he, he left the Citadel fairly rapidly after his montage. Um, but I think this I think it's going to be Sam is kind of positioned now in the books in in a place where he he is going to be the point of view for many converging storylines. Um, Aegon and the Golden Company, Euron Greyjoy, and I and I think this is how we're going to see more of House House Hightower is through Sam. Um, I do think we're going to see more of House House Hightower, but I think ultimately. Uh, as far as them suddenly coming out of the tower and making this huge power grab or play, I can't see it happening. I, 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 I see no reason why they would suddenly uh, about change the pattern that they have set for thousands of years that has proved extremely successful to date. Um, which is what we've discussed, hedging their bets, having one foot in each camp, play sides off each other. Um, you know, when the the White Walkers come, this could be the game changer. Um, and if this being able to see the wall from the high tower is a hint that Leighton is watching the wall and, and therefore potentially knows something, if not a lot, about the White Walkers, then that could be a different scenario altogether. But I think as far as the general polit political play within Westeros as it stands, House Hightower are not going to be going out of their way to draw that target on their back, so to speak. I agree. I don't think that they're going to come out in the open. No. I think that what's very clear just from what's happened when you get the Greyjoys took the, the Shield Islands, which are... Uh, not right next door to where Old Town is, but close enough for them to start getting a little bit nervous. After that, Leighton Hightower seems to start to busy himself with the world, not just be locked up in his high tower. He sends out his children off on these various tasks about building ships or doing the defences and raising up an army and things like that. So, so he's clearly clocked that something's happening. He's clearly moving. And, and these things seem to be all about the defence of Old Town, not That's about getting good. involved in bigger political matters. This is about actually let's defend our position here. They are certainly manoeuvring. I mean, we do know that Garth Greysteel, um, one of Leighton's sons, is training troops at Old Town. And we know that Sir Humphrey Hightower has been sent to lease to hire cell sales. So they are yeah. definitely bolstering their naval support, which is already massive. But what reason would you want to bolster specifically your naval forces? Um, an ironborn attack is very much a reason for that, isn't it? Ab absolutely. And the, the, the least link is really fascinating here because, of course, uh, who is there? That's Lyness Hightower, who was the woman who married uh, Jorah Mormont. And she having gone all the way up to Bear Island, found that it was beautiful but incredibly dull, bankrupt him, and when he was trying his best to please her in the way that he felt that she needed, he sent down into the slave trade. She abandoned him eventually, and she ended up in lease, where she's now chief concubine to someone or other, I think. Tremor um, or Mullen, I think. Oh, Good knowledge. <laughs> Love it like that. Um, but so so that's where she is. So going over to Lease to try and hire some uh, cell sales is not just a, oh, let's go there. There is actually a family link across there. Yeah, um, Gun Gunthor's building up the harbour defences. Baylor Bright Smile or Baylor Breakwind is uh, building ships. He's it, Leighton's basically got all of his children on the case, hasn't he? Yeah. So they're not just sitting in the shadows biding that they are biding their time they are hedging their bets but they are not completely inactive in that process far from it no i agree but the, again i think the point i would say here is this is defensive 
yes. not them going out trying to change the world. So any idea that uh, perhaps the idea that Gerald Hightower was at the Tower of Joy, therefore this means that the whole Hightower family are part of some secret <laughs> to do with John. I personally, I think that that's just a little bit too fanciful for my liking. I think that they're looking after themselves as that house always has. Yeah. Can I put to you one other uh, link here that I, I find quite worrying for the high towers, I have to say, is that when I think of the high tower, as I said, I immediately think of the great lighthouse at Alexandria, a yeah. huge tower with a flame on top of it. The other thing that ancient Alexandria was famed for was their great library, the greatest library in the ancient world. Now, this has slightly been um, played up through sort of history lessons, um, so it wasn't quite this dramatic, but the, the legend of the Library of Alexandria was that it was burned to the ground. And all of the great knowledge that was within it was lost forever. Do you think that George R. R. Martin could be subtly trying to um, warm us up to the idea that there might be a raid by the Ironborn and they might burn down the Citadel. I think that is extremely plausible. Um, I'm pretty sure that Melisandre, I don't have the, the reference, um, this is from memory, that she had a vision of a tower or towers falling. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wish I had the reference to that one, but you, you've just brought that one to mind. Um, Again, Melisandre's visions are very subject to misinterpretation, as we've seen. By um, her misinterpretation, not, yeah. not, not yours, Gemma. Your, no. your, your interpretations are always fully correct. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that that's very Euron-esque. You know, th this is what they do. They they loot and they pillage. Um, and, you know, the House Hightower and Old Town's defences are really good we know they're really good but they're not infallible old town has fallen several times um historically and the euron greyjoy in particular is not to be messed with he's certainly not to be taken lightly he's certainly up to some very bizarre blood magic ritual kraken type magic thing so who knows what he's coming with um i and i think there is a very good chance that a lot of high, um, Old Town will burn. So, yeah, I, I, I think I'm not sure if the High Tower itself will collapse as per Mel's visions. When I first encountered the wall in this text, you know, my immediate thoughts were, well, this is the biggest Chekhov's gun I've ever seen in my life. Um, I can't wait for this structure to collapse because of yeah. course it has to but when i first encountered the high tower um i, I didn't see it in the same way it, it never occurred to me that it might might collapse in some dramatic fashion um but the citadel very much like the great library of alexandria um i i think it's gonna burn i think i'm with you yeah, I, I think it's it makes me sad, the idea of libraries burning, but yes. I, suspect, I suspect this might be where it is. And it would not surprise me if we end up in a situation where Old Town burns, tens, hundreds of thousands die, the citadel is razed to the ground, and yet House Hightower and the Hightower itself somehow manage to survive Persevere. and remain powerful into whatever new world we have moving on from this. This seems to be the story of House Hightower, is that they somehow manage to survive. They're as old as any house in the Seven Kingdoms in Westeros, and they have carried on all the way through. They know what's going on. They are preparing for what is happening and I would be surprised if House Hightower dies out in the way that we've seen, say, House Tyrell buy out on the show. I couldn't have said it better myself. I am in absolute agreement with you on that score. Excellent. That sounds like a perfect place to end before I say something else that means that we're not in for the room. <laughs> um, uh, guys, you know that if you've been watching this channel for some time, you know I'm a big fan of Gemma and her channel, Secrets and Citadel. I will let her big herself up and uh, let us know what to look out for on her channel. Gemma, 
if people want to find you, where can they find you and what should they look for? Um, I'm Secrets of the Citadel on everything, basically. Um, the only one that's different is Instagram, where I'm at Citadel Secrets, um, because I didn't have enough character space. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm quite easy to find. Uh, thank you again for having me on it's absolute pleasure to collaborate with you not just because our time zones uh match up beautifully <laughs> um, but no, thank you for having me on i really enjoyed these discussions i've just glanced at the time and realized we have gone on way longer than usual and i didn't even notice i was having such a wonderful time talking house high tower with you um i've got lots more unravelings of both a clash of kings and fire and blood coming up once again, thank you for listening and thank you for having me on, Robert. Always a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Guys, as I said, this is a series we're doing shared across our two channels. So this one is obviously on my channel, uh, but three of these videos are going to be over on Gemma's channel, Secrets and Citadel. And while you're there, please do go check out some of our other content. I will take the opportunity just to say thank you to my patrons. As Gemma said, this is the kind of thing that we both like to uh, put in front of our patrons, a, a chance actually to have an input into what we do. So if you're at all interested in supporting this channel, or if you're wanting to get access to some extra benefits like my uh, audio narrations from the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter, or a chance to influence future content, please do go check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash in Deep Geek. But that's all for this time. We will be back next time on Gemma's channel. And that's it for this time. Take care, everyone, and I shall see you again soon.